Father, we thank you again for this day and just for this chance to share the communion with each other and with you. And we thank you for the worship that we've had in song and for how that has ministered to us. And now, Lord, as we worship you by looking into your word, I pray that once again you would just speak to our hearts and that you would challenge us to a closer walk with you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. If you would, as the lights are coming back on, uh, go ahead and turn around in your chairs and um, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. <clears throat> we'll give everyone a chance to get that last cup of coffee and seated. It's hard to believe that it's October and as hot as it's been all, all month. Um, I'm a warm weather guy, but I'm really kind of waiting for some fall weather, some cooler temperatures. Last week we started a series, um, something that I've just been thinking with, thinking about the last uh, little while. The title of the overall series is What in the World? With the idea of... Um, looking at just things going on in our world today, and it seems to be an interesting time to be alive. And so what in the world? Last week was what in the world is going on. Today is what in the world are we to do? And then next Sunday we'll conclude with how in the world will it end? And so I just want to give a quick review of where we were last week before we jump into the, today's uh, sermon. But last week, we talked about all the things that are going on in the world, the divisiveness that we sense in our own country. And of course, that divisiveness is around the world as well. But maybe, you know, sometimes even though I tried to give us a warning about not being too Eurocentric, which means looking at things through our eyes only, we think when things happen in the United States that somehow or another that means um, now that biblical prophecy is being fulfilled when in reality things that we're experiencing have been going on around the world for quite uh, for quite some time, but we talked about the divisiveness, the wars, and the rumors of wars that we hear. Just this past week, one of the U.S. generals said to, with the situation in Korea that we need, as a country, we need to prepare ourselves for the worst. Uh, and that's not something you'd like to hear from your generals, but that was a statement made this week. And then, so there's threats of wars, and then the mass killings from, um, <clears throat> from um, Las Vegas, from the bombing in, um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I forgot this, but bombing in one of the countries in Africa where 300 some odd people were killed. And, and then of course, natural disasters from the earthquakes that we've experienced, or the hurricanes and the earthquakes and, and um, all kinds of things just going on around the world where it seems like that, you know, what in the world is going on? And so that was the question last week. And based on the passage of scripture that we looked at last week, 2 Thessalonians 2, Verses 1 through 17 just simply brought out two things that Paul says has to happen before the return of Christ. Now, when Paul mentioned those things, he was really thought that Christ would return in his own lifetime. And so every generation of believers needs to have that feeling that this could be the day Jesus returns. But the two things that Paul says has to happen before Christ returns. And the reason he said these two things is because... People in the church in Thessalonica had thought that Jesus had already returned and the rapture had already occurred and they were left behind. But he says before Christ returns, there has to be a rebellion, mainly I think a spiritual rebellion where people turn away from God and where churches turn away from God. But then the man of lawlessness has to be revealed. And for Paul, that would have been the Roman emperor. People oftentimes say, well, that points to the Antichrist. Well, my particular view is that throughout history, there are several antichrists, several times in history where people have stood up um, in a powerful position and been antithetical to everything Jesus is. People like Hitler, people like Nero, if you go back there, and then all throughout history, you see these people. And so maybe in some sense, it is cyclical that these things just kind of happen over and over again. And to, as we get closer to the end, it will happen more abundantly and, you know, more rapidly and maybe more severely. But today's question is, what in the world are we to do? <clears throat> Have you ever gone to a movie and at the end of the movie, um, you know, the movie may have been about something real life 
And at the end of the movie, instead of wrapping it up where everybody lives happily ever after, they kind of wrap it up in a negative way. And you leave the movie thinking, man, I feel horrible. You know, uh, Saving Private Ryan may have been a little bit like that. You know, um, <clears throat> Clint Eastwood's, one of his last Westerns, uh, Forgiven, right? It's not Unforgiven, that's another movie, but Forgiven, uh, Unforgiven was kind of like that. You left thinking, ah, oh, this is bad. Or maybe television shows. I was commenting last night with some people and, um, and so, you know, you kind of tell where my mind was even last night about this morning, but television shows like This Is Us. <clears throat> I quit watching that show because it was too much like us. <laughs> you know, I want to watch a television show to escape reality, not be reminded of reality. And so sometimes you watch that, yeah, there may be good, now Misty still watches it, but they might go do something else. They're like, this is too real. I don't, I got, <laughs> my life's real enough. I don't need this extra drama going on uh, from that. But you leave kind of feeling worse. And, I, and the reason I, I bring that illustration up is because I imagine maybe some people felt that way last Sunday. When you talk about world events, you might leave feeling a little depressed. Um, but yet the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, that when we talk about these things and we talk about prophecies and we talk about Christ returning, Paul says that we're to encourage each other with these words. That it should be an encouragement to us when we see things going on around us and it may seem to be chaotic because we know ultimately what all of that means. In my lifetime, I can think of several occasions when prophecy preachers were claiming the end was near. And I've shared this with you before that I grew up, I know a little strange. When I was in junior high, I started reading Hal Lindsey books and was fascinated by the, about the end of the world stuff and would just read all of that kind of stuff. It may not have been very healthy, but I did anyway. But in my lifetime, there's been several times when people have talked about the end of the time for some reason, and I'm still not quite sure about this. It has to do with generations and stuff like that. But a lot of people, based on Israel's becoming a nation in 1948, were convinced that Jesus would return in the 1970s. I hope that didn't happen. <laughs> right? When I was in college, and one guy made a lot of money because he wrote a little book entitled... 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988. And my granddad was fascinated by that book and convinced that the book was correct. Well, Jesus didn't come back in 1988. And so the guy updated his book and called it 89 reasons why Jesus will return in 1989. <laughs> well, he didn't come back in 1989, or at least I hope he didn't. <laughs> And he quit writing from then on, I guess, too. You know, you fool me once, fool me twice, but not a third time, right? Maybe some of you remember that, maybe not, because, you know, I, I live in a different world. <clears throat> every, time the, every time there's an earthquake, people will cry, the end is near. And just last year, some preacher, I'm not going to call his name, but some preacher wrote a best-selling book called Blue Moon based on those moons that we had last year. And according to him, Jesus would come back in September. I don't think he did. And so Christian bookstores sell millions of books each year dealing with end times. And there are hundreds of magazines and newspapers and websites that you can subscribe to to keep yourself up to date on all of those things if you would like. It's the end of the world, it seems like, and there's no reason that we shouldn't know the exact time and the exact place of the end, right? But as I said last week, a lot of times these predictions are based on what is happening in the United States and to the United States, and it's as if the rest of the world, with the exception of Israel, doesn't exist. And we gotta be careful when we read scripture through the lenses of our own tradition in the United States. It can lead us down some dangerous roads. But what are some signs of the end of time? Well, one day, Mark chapter 13. What Mark chapter 13 verse 1 tells us. One day, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what 
magnificent buildings. The temple that they were leaving was known as Herod's temple, and it was an architectural wonder of the day. It was massive. Some of the walls in the temple were 160 feet, 165 feet high, and the whole project to build what we called Solomon's temple, the entire project took 46 years to complete. It was massive. The beauty of the temple elicited pride and a sense of security among the Jewish people. Here they were living in a strange land or or being, it was their land, but, but living in a land where they were oppressed by the Roman government and didn't have a lot of rights, there was that temple that was a sign of their own prosperity and their own security and their own God. And it was impressive. And so Jesus' disciples <clears throat> were leaving the temple with Jesus and said, look, Jesus, isn't this Impressive. The temple was not just a building, it was more like a campus, a temple area, and it was quite extensive. <clears throat> and so Jesus responds in verse 2. <clears throat> Do you see all these great buildings? <clears throat> Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. <clears throat> the disciples were saying, look, Jesus, how impressive this building was. And Jesus said, it's all going to be torn down one day. And they were stunned by this statement. <clears throat> we're not told if anything else was sad. Maybe they thought about this for a while, but they left Jerusalem and were heading to Bethany a few miles away. And once they were outside the temple on, on their way back to Bethany, Jesus stopped on the Mount of Olives, which was directly across the Kidron Valley from the temple. And from here, he and, his, he and his disciples could see the temple and the whole courts and most of the city of Jerusalem. And so Jesus stopped to take a break. And as they were taking a break on this Mount of Olives where they could oversee all of Jerusalem, notice what happens, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Their question brings a complicated and complex reply by Jesus. In his answer, Jesus discusses the destruction of the temple, which happened in 70 A.D., some 30 or 40 years after Christ. Specifically, that's what Jesus was referring to, that the temple, that temple in a mere generation is going to be destroyed. But yet, wrapped within his explanation are signs about his, his eventual return at some point in the future. And so a lot of the prophecies in Scripture have an immediate fulfillment as well as a future fulfillment. And so in 70 A.D., Jesus' words came true and the temple was completely destroyed. But wrapped up in that explanation are some things about when Christ will return as well. And so very, very quickly, because this is a long passage and so I'm going to read fast. But very, very quickly read or listen or follow along with me. Mark chapter 13, verse 5. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. <clears throat> On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. <clears throat> and the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and, <clears throat> and brought to trial, do not worry, because, um, be, do not worry <clears throat> before, beforehand about what, you, uh, about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Brother will betray brother <clears throat> to death. 
and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back uh, to get his coat. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not um, take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ, false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. For in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then, he, and then he says, At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the of the heaven. In Mark chapter 13 verse 4 the disciples asked for a sign that would explain when these things were about to happen. Specifically again they wanted to know about the sign that the temple was about to be destroyed but Jesus goes further and gives them signs about what will happen before the end of time. The problem is Jesus doesn't tell us which is for which event. He doesn't say, now listen, when this stuff happens, then the temple will be destroyed. And then when this stuff happens, the end will come. He doesn't tell us which one. Maybe, they, maybe pretty much everything that we read, you could find fulfillment before 70 AD. But yet the idea of, of that they're going to see the Son of Man come from the clouds, well, that's, that hasn't happened yet. And so there's this double edge to these prophecies. And Jesus doesn't tell us this sign was for the temple and this sign is for my return. And so it's complicated. Thus, the signs that Jesus gives us here cannot be understood as some type of guide or some type of steps to the end. The signs are not that we see that sign happen when we check that off the list. Well, there's one, we check that one off the list. Well, there's another one, we check that one off the list. There's another one, and then when all those signs are done, okay, Christ, where are you? The signs were not meant to be A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, and then the end. Rather, they are signs of the times that have to be watched by every generation. Every generation will experience these things. But the key to me is that phrase, like birth pains. Because what happens in birth? The closer you get to the actual birth, the labor pains increase in frequency and intensity. And then you know the end is near. But most people who are pregnant have false labor pains, right? They think they're going into labor because of something going, but it, then it doesn't. It, and so to me, that's kind of what happens. The world gets in a turmoil and, and, and we're having labor pains and we think it's the end, but then it calms down. But as we get closer to the end, as labor pains increase in frequency and intensity, then these things will increase in frequency and intensity. But they're not signs to look for and say, one, two, three, four, Jesus come back, but rather things that we're just to be watching. We are not to be waiting and worrying about signs. Rather, we are to be watching for his return and working until he returns. So, as believers, living in this chaotic age that we're living in with all these things going on around us, what in the world are we to do? 
I have no idea how close, how close we are to when Jesus will return. I don't even want to try to guess. I do know that we're closer today than we were yesterday. And I do know that God doesn't want us to live in fear. And I do know that, that when he does return, Jesus does not want to find us hunkered down, chewing on beef jerky, hiding from our neighbors, living in the woods, stockpiling water, making sure we got enough ammunition instead of going out into our communities and serving him until he does return. Does that make sense? I do know that's what he wants us to do. I don't know when it's going to happen, but he has called us to go into the world. And so the question is, as a follower of Jesus Christ, what do we do until he returns? Well, here's some suggestions. First, recognize the sovereignty of God. I've said this even last week. We can rest assured. We can know that it is well with our souls because God will never be caught off guard. Nothing will ever happen that surprises him. He is still on the throne. He is still in control and he is still sovereign. And he is the only one who knows what's going to happen in the future. Thus, he is the only one who should be trusted. Recognizing his sovereignty brings peace in the midst of the storm. I have no idea why things happen like they do, but I know that God is sovereign and he is in control. I have no idea why things are so chaotic. I don't understand how, how all these things can occur, but I know that God is sovereign. Maybe if I was God, I would do things differently, right? You ever thought that? But <laughs> I'm glad you're not God. But God is sovereign. Listen to just these few words from different passages in the Bible. Remember that I am God and there is no other God. I am God and there is no one like me. From the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. A long time ago, I told you things that have not yet happened. When I plan something, it happens. What I want to do, I will do. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Doesn't matter what's going on. If I'm committed to Christ, he'll look out for me. Job chapter 12, verse 13. But only God has wisdom and power, good advice and understanding. In Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Our understanding has a lot of limit. But his has no limit. And so I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And that knowledge should give me a sense of security and peace, even in the middle of chaos. My life is in his hands. Second of all, place your faith in God's hands or place your future in God's hands. The story is told of a, a guy named Jack who was one day walking along a steep cliff when he accidentally got too close to the edge and he fell. On the way down, he was able uh, to grab onto a limb and that stopped his fall at least temporarily. But there he hung, hanging on for dear life. He could see that below the canyon fell a thousand or feet or so. And so Jack began yelling for help, hoping that somebody up top would hear him. And so he cries out, help, help, is anyone there? Help. And he yelled for hours, but no one heard him. And he was about to give up when he finally heard a voice say, Jack, is that you? Yes, it is. I can hear you. I'm down here. The voice said, I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Yes, but who are you and where are you? And the voice said, and you've heard this story, I am the Lord. And Jack said, you mean you're God? Yes, that's me. God, please help me. I promise if you'll get me down from here, I'll stop sinning. I'll start tithing. I'll be a really good person and I'll serve you the rest of my life. And God says, easy there, Jack, easy. Be careful on those promises. But now there is one thing I want you to do. So listen carefully. I'll do anything, Lord. Just tell me what you want me to do. And God says, okay, Jack, let go of the branch. What? Let go of the branch. 
And then there was a long silence. And finally, Jack yelled back up top, is anyone else up there? Right. We're like Jack, aren't we? We have messed up our lives and we have fallen off a cliff and we're barely hanging on. Now, we believe in God and we say we trust him, but we are afraid to let go and follow him. We want to be in control in our lives. And what's really odd is even when we know our lives are out of control, we still want to be in control. And we want to be in control and we want to hang on and we want to have the reins over, over our life. And God can see that we're in trouble. And we call out to God for help. But then God says, let go. And we're like, oh, God, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. So how do you do that? How do you place your future in his hands? Well, the Bible tells us that first you have to admit that you're a sinner and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Romans 3.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's 3.23. 6.23 is the wages of sin. So we got to say, God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. And then the Bible says that we have to believe that Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so we admit that we're a sinner. We ask for forgiveness. We believe that Jesus is Lord, and then we commit our life to him. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your, your, your color. It doesn't matter your economic situation. It doesn't matter your education situation. The Bible says whoever calls upon God's name will be saved. So what in the world are we to do? Well, we're to recognize the sovereignty of God, place our future in his hands, and then stand strong in your faith. If you listen to all the doomsayers in our society, you will become discouraged and fearful. I mean, seriously, just don't raise your hand, but just be honest for a second. Have you ever watched the news and decided, I can't watch that anymore, that's too depressing, that's too scary. But yet if God is sovereign, if I've committed my life to him, what is there to be afraid of? I should see this as, you know what? Now is the time I've got to stand up and be strong as a believer. No matter what happens, we know this for a fact. No matter what happens in the future, we know that in the end, God wins. And we win with him. You know, it's kind of like sometimes we joke around if... Um, you know, maybe you watch a replay of a sporting event and you already know the outcome. And we may joke around thinking, well, I'm hoping my team wins this time, you know, and we know they're not, right? But we've already know the outcome and so we watch it and so all the emotions of ups and downs during the game don't bother us near as much because we know the outcome. If you read God's word, we know the outcome. <laughs> We've already seen it. We've already been told what's going to happen. And so the ups and the downs and, the, and all that going on in life shouldn't really get us too upset because we know what happens in the end. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, in all these things, and those things include wars and natural disasters and terrorist attacks and economic downturns. In all those things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That the world is coming to an end is a biblical fact. When it will end, no one knows. Our job is to stand strong in our faith. That's our job. And then fourth, what are we to do? Well, we're to be a bold witness for Jesus Christ. 
above everything else. The events in the world today is an incredible opportunity for us to share our faith. Did you get that? People are hungry for meaning and they are searching for purpose in life. They are searching for some type of meaning to explain what in the world is going on. People are more open now than ever before to hear the good news that Jesus loves them. And he wants to give them their life meaning and purpose. Now, they may be tired of religion. <laughs> they might not necessarily like church folk. That's a whole other sermon. But they are looking for someone to give them meaning and purpose. And we know that that is in Christ. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. Now is the time, now is not the time to be faint of heart, but now is the time to be strong and to be willing to share your faith with other people. In other words, you remain calm, cool, and collective. You rest in the sovereignty of God and the fact that your life is in your hands. And then when the world is acting all crazy around you, people are going to notice that and they're going to say, how can you be so calm? Are you crazy? And you say, well, I may be crazy, but... The reason I'm calm is because I know that my life is in God's hands. He is sovereign over all. And let me tell you about it. You see, God's word instructs us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, to always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give reason for the hope that you have. There is no need to be afraid of the future. There is no need to be stressed out when you watch the news. There is no need to be worried about all this. We can have hope because God is sovereign. Your future is in his hands. You are standing strong in your faith and you have more opportunities than ever before to be a witness. And so take advantage of the chaos when the subject of the end of the world comes up at work or at school or in your neighborhoods, be willing to share your thoughts. When people ask, man, things seem really crazy today. I don't understand what's going on. You can say, I don't understand what's going on either, but let me tell you what I do know. God is sovereign. He loves you. He loves me. And you can place your faith in him. And regardless of what's going on around the world, you can have this sense of peace. So, do recent events mean that the world is coming to an end soon? I, I don't know. I don't even want to lose sleep over that. I hope Jesus comes back today. I'm tired. If Jesus comes back today, I don't have to watch the Titans play anymore. <laughs> I don't have to worry about UT getting a new coach. Right? I, mean, I hope he comes back today, you know. I'd like to see my grandchild, but that's okay. I can live with that. What's going to happen in the future? I don't know. What I do know is you probably think it's not good news. You know, it's going to get worse, not better. You know, these things are just going to continue. I, I don't know. I don't know. If I did, I'd play the lottery. <laughs> you know, because I know what's going to happen. I don't know. But I do know that God is sovereign and he can be trusted with my future. He has not let me down yet. Now, I've let him down, but he has not let me down. I do know that I can stand strong in my faith and I can be bold in my witness. And people may think I'm crazy, but at least I can sleep at night. Right? Because I know something bad. You ever go to bed at night and wonder what's going to happen? <laughs> on the news when I get up in the morning, what's, what am I going to find, you know, you know. I mean, I do that, but then it's like, okay, God, you're in control. I'm glad I'm not in control. I'll just go to bed and I'll find out what happens when it happens. Maybe I'll never wake up again. <laughs> Let's see. Are you ready for the challenges ahead? In your heart, are you ready for what may come? If persecution does come, are you ready for it? Are you ready to stand up and say you are a Christian, even if it may cost you something? It could cost you a promotion at work. It could cost you, a, so it, it might cost you your life. Are you ready for that? 
Do you need to commit your life to him? Do you need to decide that, you know what, I'm going to stand firm. I'm tired of this. Now is the time to truly follow Jesus and to quit being just a go-to-church type person. But to truly follow Jesus. Now is that time. Do you need to prepare yourself for the fact that he is coming back? It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now. But he is coming back. Are you ready for that? All these things that are happening, maybe what should cross our mind is, thank you, Lord, that your word is true and that we are closer today to your return than we were yesterday. Thank you, Lord. What am I doing with my life while I'm waiting for his return? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I know with some people, when you talk about end times, they get a little scared and a little nervous. And I just keep going back to that phrase in Thessalonians. Encourage one another with these words. And so, Lord, encourage our hearts. That what we see going on around us is evidence that your word is true and that people need Jesus. And now... It's a wonderful time to be able to stand up and be counted as a follower of you. Now is a wonderful time to be able to share our faith with other people who, who are looking at the world, knowing that things are crazy, and trying to find meaning and purpose through it all. And so, Lord, be with us today who need to make those commitments and say, God, today I am giving you my life and I am committing myself to you and I want to be bold and strong in my faith. Lord, speak to our hearts. And for those of us who have that prayer, I know as soon as we say that prayer, the Holy Spirit's going to say, okay, if you want to truly follow, and you need to stop doing this. You need to start doing this. You need to be careful with this. You need to pick up that. And so, Lord, help us to make those changes. We're going to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. And you're going to say, okay, let go. And we're going to be hesitant. Lord, help us to let go of whatever it is that may be keeping us from following you. Help us to stand firm in our faith. Help us to just be able to share our faith with boldness, to not be afraid, even at work or just out in our neighborhoods when somebody says something about how crazy the world is, to not be afraid to get in that conversation and let them know of our faith and how we have found comfort and peace in that, and they can too. Help us to be bold, Lord, to speak about our faith at work, in our neighborhoods, and in our homes. Help us to be bold. Watch over us now as we go our separate ways. Encourage us, keep us strong. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for each person who is here and what they mean uh, to this church. Thank you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me and let's say our prayer. Our prayer at FCC, as we leave this place of worship and fellowship, let us commit ourselves to love and serve God by loving and serving our neighbors. You're dismissed.